Okay, I know we still have people filing in. However, I know we also have a lot of content to cover. So I want to want to make sure you have enough time and space to ask all the questions that you want and absorb all of the material today. So hi, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our 2024 labor law update. Today is sponsored by Monterey County Works. My name is Anna Manzano Fairbairn, and I am the digital media and event strategist here at the California Employers Association. Before we officially begin today's webinar, I have just a couple things to go over with you. Um, as you see, your audio is going to be muted throughout today's presentation, but there will be lots of opportunities to engage during the session. Uh, if you have any questions pertaining to the presentation, you can type them into the Q&A box at any time. Um, if you're on a computer that's along the bottom with the two bubbles, Q&A, um, and we'll try to address them as we go. We are fortunate to have two trainers today. So while one is delivering the content, one will be um, managing that Q&A box. And I will be uh, watching in the chat box. If you have any technical issues, um, you can reach me there. Uh, handouts for this training, those were sent out in yesterday's reminder email. Uh, in case you didn't receive them or didn't end up in your spam folder, just please go ahead and drop your email into the chat box to me and I'll make sure I get that sent over to you right away. Last but not least, uh, we have a survey. Yeah, because your feedback is incredibly important to us, we have a five question survey that takes less than two minutes, but the feedback that you provide to us really does help us to continue to develop our suite of resources and trainings. Um, we share the information with our partners at Monterey um, so that we can all in turn better serve you. So if you can take the two minutes to, um, to help us with, the, with your feedback at the end, there will be a QR code and I'll drop a link into the chat and that would be greatly appreciated. So as I mentioned, today's training is sponsored by our partners at Monterey County Works. And today we are grateful to have Laura Kirshner, the business services specialist, to share more about the resources available to you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you so much, Anna, for, uh, for introducing me, for having us today. We're delighted to, uh, to sponsor this uh, webinar. I um, wanted to go over just briefly some of the services that are offered to our local uh, Monterey County businesses uh, at no cost to them. Uh, we've got great recruitment opportunities for businesses. Um, you can get a hold of us if you're interested in scheduling, being a part of one of our job fairs or scheduling a specialized recruitment. We'd be delighted to help you. We've got uh, job boards and other promotional activities that we make available for you. You can post to our job board or we'd be happy to make post for you. Uh, we can also post to CalJobs, which is something that folks kind of forget about, but I'm happy to post a job order to our uh, CalJobs account. That can be kind of confusing for lots of employers. We've got some incentivized training opportunities, including on-the-job training that we incentivize employers to, um, to hire people within our programs and services at 50% of the individual's wage. We also have incumbent worker training for uh, for local employers. And that puts people uh, back to work who've been with an employer, well, actually puts them um, an, an existing employer who's been with the business for at least six months, an opportunity to upscale in, lay, in lieu of laying, laying them off. That's called incumbent worker training, or one of our training programs. We also have some other new resources. We've got human resources hotline, which is great uh, for you to be able to utilize as well as rapid response. If you happen to be going the other way and downsizing, that's something that we want our local employers to know about, that we can help you and uh, sort of blunt the blow for local for employees that might be uh, being laid off. And it also helps the employer. You can bring them down to a half-time employee if you're so inclined. Um, I'd like to also chat about our some of our newer services, including our employment training videos. If we want to go to the next slide, I want to encourage our local uh, businesses is to contact us here at 831-796-3341 uh, if you might be interested in some of our employment uh, hiring videos. Uh, this is a um, part of our new suite of services to help our local businesses. Uh, you can have a recruitment video if you're doing some hiring. We've also got the uh, some meeting rooms that are available for you if you're needing a place to meet, especially here at in Salinas, there's some, uh, one of our great big meeting rooms will hold up to uh, 70 people. So please contact us, utilize us as a resource for you. We're in the downtown Salinas area and we are happy and ready to serve. 
Uh, you can reach me if we want to go to the next slide. Uh, oh, we've got some other upcoming webinars. Make sure that we uh, promote those for you. Um, there's some throughout uh, this coming fiscal year. Uh, the next one will take place on, Feb on uh, February 14th, Tips for Your um, Employee Handbook. So there's a very... Um, various webinars coming up. We encourage you that when you see the, um, the uh, invites from, uh, from CEA, take advantage of those. These are for your benefit. Um, this is something that we are sponsoring and we're delighted to do so. Um, if you need to reach me, please feel free to reach out at, at 831-796-3341 or kirshnerl at co.monterey.ca.us. Also take a peek at our newly revised website, montereycountyworks.com. We're here to serve and we want to make sure that you uh, know we're here to help you if you have any questions. Thank you so much, ladies. All right. So I know that some of this information was included in your handout. So um, definitely, if you're if you're like me, I like having things in multiple places. So I, I would recommend taking also a screenshot of this, um, as well as downloading the PDF file uh, that I dropped into the chat, just so that you have, um, you know, an outline of the resources and how to get in touch with Laura and her team, as well as um, reaching out to our HR hotline. So thank you again, Laura, and your entire team at Monterey County for bringing all these people together today to learn about our labor law updates here in California. So uh, that being said, I have the privilege of introducing our trainers today. Um, we have Jessica Hawthorne, our senior vice president, as well as Mary Bradford, our HR director. And I know we have so much to cover. So ladies, it's all yours. All right, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good afternoon, wherever in America or the universe you may be. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Monterey County Works. What an amazing resource for employers in your county to get all of this support with running your company and those sort of things. And we're honored to have your HR hotline. So the HR hotline is free for any employer in Monterey County, sponsored by Monterey County Works. Uh, we'll put the phone number in the chat just so you have that handy. Because if you have questions following our webinar today that we may not be able to answer or maybe you didn't think of until after the webinar, call that HR hotline. We are here eight to five, Monday through Friday and happy to answer whatever questions you have related to human resources, hiring, firing, leaves of absence, all of those things, and that's what we're here for. That being said, we are not a law firm and we cannot practice law, nor can we give you legal advice. So please don't take anything either Mary or I say today as legal advice. If there's a moment today where either Mary or I say something and you have a uh-oh moment or hmm, we don't do that right. Call the hotline. We may be able to help you, but if it's something where you need legal advice, we can always refer you to uh, one of our partners or you can talk to your own legal counsel. But anything we say today is really for information and educational purposes only. We are human resources. We That's all we do. We cover the state of California and our mission really is to provide employers with peace of mind. And hopefully we do that today. And if we don't do that today, call the hotline because we may be able to smooth out those edges of information that maybe you weren't prepared to hear today. You never know what the legislature is gonna do here in California. So we are here to uh, sift through that and make that really palatable for California employers. <clears throat> Pardon me. So today we're gonna to cover the mandatory paid sick leave expansion for 2024. There is a new reproductive loss leave right. Cannabis use rights have been greatly expanded and protected. There's now workplace violence prevention plan requirements that will go into effect later this year. There's been a minimum wage increase for the state and uh, therefore an exempt salary increase. There's a couple of agency and some regulatory changes. And as Anna mentioned, while I am chatting away, Mary Bradford will be in the Q&A box, the one with the two bubbles, answering whatever questions you have. She may interrupt me as we go along if there's questions that come up that apply to everybody. And then while Mary is chatting with you, I will cover that Q&A box. So hopefully we get all your questions answered today. But again, that hotline is a great resource for follow-up questions. So February 14th, you guys have a free employee handbooks webinar. And if you haven't updated your handbook for 2024, 2024 is really the year to do it. It's really a good idea to update it every year, but so many 
changes for 2024 that we're going to talk about today that cover almost every portion of your handbook. So really important to take a look at your handbook as far as paid sick leave, this NLRB standard that we're going to go over, the National Labor Relations Board has really expanded uh, communication rights on behalf of employees. So a lot of disclaimer language is necessary in your handbooks. There's new protections under our government code, which we call the Fair Employment Housing Act or FEHA. Um, so a lot of changes this year. So take a look at your employee handbook or you know, wait till the February 14th webinar. And uh, we're happy to help you out with that situation as well. So that is the big takeaway for 2024. Now let's start with leaves of absence. We have a lot of leaves of absence in California, but everyone's favorite is paid sick leave. Mandatory paid sick leave has been around since July of 2015. <clears throat> They've been talking about increasing it ever since, and they finally bit the bullet this year. So prior to 2024, employers in California, unless a local paid sick leave ordinance applied, California employers are required to provide 24 hours or three days of paid sick leave to all of their employees. Doesn't matter how many employees you have, doesn't matter if your employees are full-time or part-time, all employers prior to 2024 were required to provide three days or 24 hours. Now, effective January 1, 2024, California employers are required to provide five days or 40 hours of paid sick leave. You can limit the use to five days and 40 hours of each year. So what, the, what does that mean? You got to provide, limit use. How do we give this to employees? And in reality, if you have a paid sick leave policy currently in place, the only the main thing that's really changed is the amount of time you have to provide employees. Not a lot else has changed. So there's a couple options. You can do a lump sum or you can do the accrual method. The lump sum is you pick a 12 month period, January 1, December 31, employee anniversary, whatever that 12 month period is. And at the beginning of that 12 month period, you give them five days or 40 hours. Just out the gate, they get five days or 40 hours. For the accrual method, that's when the standard is every 30 hours that somebody works, they're gonna earn one hour of paid sick leave. Now, for most employees, you know, 30 hours is less than a week. So they're going to get up to 40 hours pretty quickly. Right now, or prior to January 1, you had to, you could do the one for 30, cap it at 48 hours, limit the use to 24. For 2024, the cap is now 48, or pardon me, is the cap is now 80 hours and you limit the use to 40. You can also do days. So you can cap it at 10 days, accruing at one hour for every 30 hours work, but limit the use to 40 hours in the 12 month period. The reason why we do that is so all of your current employees start your 12 month period with either a lump sum of 40 hours or the leftover accrual that they couldn't use. So each year they start out with 40 hours. Another caveat to uh, pay attention to is the cap in usage is 80 hours and 10 days. That's the cap. The usage is limited to 40 hours or five days, but that's whichever is greater. So here's an example. If you have people who work 10 hour shifts, if they work four days, they're going to earn 40 hours. But the requirement is five days or 40 hours, whichever is greater. So in essence, if you have employees who work 10 hour shifts, they're going to be allowed to use 50 hours in a 12 month period. So that's a lot of information. But again, the only thing that's really changed for most employers is the amount. If you've already done lump sum, you've already done the accrual, you're just going to change the amounts now. Nothing else really has changed for you. All the same requirements as far as um, not discriminating or inhibiting employees' ability to use this time and so forth are still in effect. 
So for employers who don't use the lump sum or this one for 30 accrual, there's also an alternative accrual method. And I updated this slide a little bit. So if you're looking at your handouts, this slide has changed a little bit, but the only thing that's changed is the example. So the alternative accrual method requires employers to guarantee 24 hours by the 120th day of employment, 40 hours by the 200th calendar day. So that's very confusing. What does that mean? How do we figure out the exact amount, those sort of things? The easiest way to do it is just pick an amount that somebody's gonna earn every week or every pay period. Just figure that out and then do the math to make sure they have at least 24 by the 120th day and at least 40 by the 200th day. So here's our example. If you're gonna use this alternative accrual method, the employees are gonna earn two hours every week. Doesn't matter if they work two hours a week or 50 hours a week, they're earning two hours of paid sick leave each week. That means by the 120th day, they'll have about 34 hours. And by the 200th day, they'll have about 57 hours. So that is a compliant policy under the alternative accrual method. And remember, you can limit the use to 40 hours or five days, whichever is greater. So even though they've earned more than what is required, you can still limit that use. So make sure your policies are very clear about accrual and usage. Uh, depending on which method you use for employees to accrue paid sick leave. Okay, so we've gotten this question a few times. So employers who use that lump sum at the beginning of a 12 month period, we give you 40 hours. But some employers use the 12 month period as an employee's anniversary date. So this law went into effect January 1 of 2024, but what if my anniversary is March 15th of 2024? And I, had, I got three days or 24 hours March of last year. So what do I do between January and March? Does the employer have to give me more time or can I just wait as the employer to reset on the employee's anniversary? And the question is, you cannot wait to the anniversary. We have to be in compliance with the paid sick leave law as of January 1 of this year. So the best practice, if you had a lump sum prior to 2024, it's just grant an additional two days or 16 hours, whichever is greater on January 1, and then make the adjustment moving forward on the employee's anniversary, or you can just switch to a calendar year for the 12 month period instead of anniversary. So just be sure that all employees on January 1 of this year had 40 hours of paid sick leave. So how are you gonna address all these new, new requirements, new accrual amounts, caps, usage, all those sort of things? Look at your policy, make sure your policy is up to date, make sure you still like it. A lot of employers are evaluating whether they wanna stick with lump sum or stick with accrual or switch to the other type of method. Um, and that's a business decision for you. And that's something we can talk through with you on the hotline. There's also a new mandatory paid sick leave policy and poster. So the policy is required under California law. So your policy does need to be updated, but your poster on paid sick leave also needs to be updated for 2024. So for example, if you buy one of those all-in-one posters from us or some other organization, make sure that all-in-one poster has the 2024 poster. The revision date on that poster is November of 2023. But the main updates on there is the amount of paid sick leave that employers must provide. So make sure you do have that up-to-date 2024 paid sick leave poster. Some people are looking at vacation accruals, how many holidays they provide. You know, that's all part and parcel of looking at your employee handbook. You do need to update wage theft notices. That's that Labor Code Section 2810.5 form that all employers are required to provide hourly non-exempt employees this is a template that the Labor Commissioner's Office has created, and it addresses paid sick leave, workers' comp coverage, a couple other things, minimum wages, actual wages, and we're required to give those to employees upon hire and whenever any information in there changes. So you're required to give employees notice of any change. So if you were providing 24 hours last year and now you're providing 40 because you have to, it's really a good practice to notify employees in writing using this form of the updated policy. 
Make sure you talk to your payroll provider about the paid sick leave available on their wage statements, because that is also a requirement. And also take a look to see if there's any local sick leave ordinances. Monterey County does not have any, but if you have remote workers who work, say, in San Francisco or San Diego, Los Angeles, there are local paid sick leave ordinances that require employers to provide more paid sick leave than the state. So if you haven't updated your 2024 poster, uh, do so now because there's a lot of updates, including the paid sick leave poster. Okay, another big change is the reproductive loss bereavement leave. So if you have five or more employees, you are now required to provide five days of bereavement leave for each reproductive loss event. Employees are eligible once they've worked for you for 30 days or more. You can limit the amount of leave taken to 20 days in a 12 month period. A reproductive loss event is specifically defined as a failed adoption, failed surrogacy, miscarriage, stillbirth, unsuccessful assisted reproduction. So if an employee has one of those events, they can take five days of protected leave and for each event up to 20 maximum days in a 12 month period. It is unpaid. You can also provide paid time or people can use their PTO or paid sick leave. This is a very confidential leave request. So only people who have a legitimate right to know why the employee is absent should know why the employee is absent. And very interestingly, the legislature has said, with this time off, the employer can't require any sort of documentation in support of the need for the leave. So if an employee comes to your office and says, I need to take some time off, um, the, my adoption didn't go through, you can't ask for any documentation in support of that leave. So make sure you're aware of that limitation. Couple of things about the use of that bereavement leave re related to a reproductive loss event. It does need to be used within three months of the event. So that's important. The only time it can extend beyond that three months is if the employee is on some other protected leaves, for example, the California Family Rights Act or Family Medical Leave Act for, you know, if the employee is taking time off for a health condition or otherwise under CFR or FEMLA, but then they need time off for the reproductive loss event, it can extend beyond that three months. Also those five days that the employee is allowed to take for each reproductive loss event, they don't need to be five days in a row. It could be a medical appointment, a legal appointment, you know, a funeral, whatever, and it can scatter throughout. So the five days don't need to be in a row. So take a look at your bereavement leave policy, make sure it addresses these new requirements and the limitations associated with taking that time leave, as well as the rights associated with taking that leave. Okay, so we have some more employee protections in California this year. And most of the employee protections do come out of our Fair Employment and Housing Act that is part of our government code. And cannabis use, is now a protected class under Fair Employment and Housing Act, which means that as employers, we can't discriminate or take any adverse action against an employee for using cannabis off the job and away from the workplace. That's the important crux here as an employer, meaning if your employee goes home and uses cannabis on their own time and doesn't come to work under the influence, we cannot take any adverse action for the employee for doing so. That, and put another way, can't come to work under the influence, can't use cannabis during our meal or rest break, can't uh, return to the work site, even if it's a work event, can't use cannabis there. There are some exceptions to these protections and they're mostly the building and construction trades or if there's some sort of testing requirement required by state or federal law. But in general private employers, this is a new protection for your employees or off the job and away from the workplace cannabis use. So what does this mean in practicality? We are really limited with our drug screening associated with cannabis use. So if you drug test employees, for example, uh, pre-employment, we, we're gonna offer you this job. And so long as your drug test comes back clean, you know, we're good to go. 
or your comp carrier may require you to do post-accident testing, for example. Under all of those circumstances, we as employers in California are no longer able to test for the non-psychoactive components of cannabis use because those indicate use in prior weeks, meaning off the job doesn't impact my ability to do the work and it wasn't at work or while I was working. So the reality of the situation is if you're doing drug screening, make sure you're working with a drug screening uh, provider who knows about the requirements and what tests are legal to use in California. So the test needs to not to test for cannabis and do it across the board, or you can do a compliant test. There's a saliva test that is that follows all the requirements in California under this new scheme. So if you are doing drug testing, make sure you are not testing uh, using urine, even some blood tests, even hair testing is not gonna be compliant. There's very limited number of tests that are compliant. So make sure you're talking to a provider that knows about all these new requirements. We do have a partner, OcuScreen, who's really well-versed in this arena and um, they can uh, provide you some really good insight on best practices for drug testing. So cannabis history is also something in California that we cannot ask about. Um, so even in an interview, if somebody brings it up, let it slide. You do not want to ask anything about cannabis use uh, of applicants or current employees. The only time you can bring that up is really if you do a background check and it comes back with some criminal history related to cannabis use. And as we know, and as we're gonna talk about a little bit later, the Fair Chance Act in California is very specific on how to handle it when an employee has a criminal history that you believe will directly impact their ability to perform their job duties. So we're gonna go over that a little bit more, but that is the only exception is when you believe and can establish that the criminal history associated with cannabis use will impact the ability for the employee to effectively perform the job. So we'll go over the Fair Chance Act in a little bit more detail later. Okay, so if you've tested employees for cannabis, make sure moving forward, whether you're gonna to continue to do that and if you are going to continue to test, you know, pre-employment, post-accident, things like that, make sure you're using a California compliant saliva-based or other compliant testing methodology. So talk to whatever organization you use to do your drug testing, make sure it's California compliant. Make sure you update those drug policies. You know, a lot of people still have policies about recreational marijuana use, medical marijuana, and outlining and carving those out in your policies. Those aren't relevant anymore because we can't do anything about off-duty cannabis use. So you do wanna take a look at your uh, drug policies to make sure they're up-to-date and compliant and make sure your managers are aware of these limitations around cannabis use. So for example, somebody comes back from their meal break and they're glassy-eyed and you know they're slow, something's off, maybe you smell a slight odor, that's a reasonable suspicion of drug use while on the job. That's very different than somebody who says, oh my God, I was at this great concert this weekend and the guy with me had great weed. We're gonna ignore that as employers. Um, so those are the differences now and those are the things we need to pay attention to and make sure your managers are aware of them. All right, shifting gears. Non-compete agreement. So California has in our constitution, a right to privacy, a right to pursuit of happiness like the federal constitution. But that right to privacy really is broadly construed in California and non-compete agreements are not spared in this process. So under our business and professions code, we outline what a non-compete agreement is. And really what a non-compete agreement is, is when you say to an employee, when you work for me, you cannot work anywhere else. And when you leave my employment, you cannot work for anybody who does something similar or is appears to be a competitor of ours. So we can't do that in California. Now there are trade secrets, 
protections, things like that. These are things to talk to your legal counsel if you want to put some limitations on people. But straight out the door, you can't say to employees, after you leave my employment, you can't work for a competitor. You just can't do that. This has been expanded where if you have somebody who even signed a non-compete agreement outside of California, it will not be enforceable in California. And if you try to enforce it, or if you impose that on an employee, that gives them a private right of action and it can get very expensive very quickly. So if you do have non-compete agreements, even if you have just sort of like a little paragraph in your employee handbook, take a look at that and talk to counsel about whether you really want to have that in your handbook and what type of agreement would be enforceable to protect your company. Because the limitations on non-competes is very, very tight. The other part of this is that if you do have non-competes, they're void now. And as employers, if you have them, you do have to prepare this written individualized communication to any current or former employee who is employed after January 1 of 2022. If they entered into a non-compete agreement with you, whether in California or elsewhere, you do need to send them an individualized notice voiding that non-compete agreement. And you must do that by Valentine's Day. So however you like to celebrate Valentine's Day, you can throw this into the mix. But you do need to have an individualized notice, send it to the last known address and email address. And if you do not do this, it's considered unfair competition claim. And those can go back pretty far and get pretty expensive. This is also a nice friendly reminder that when an employee leaves, whether good news or bad news, get their current address and email address because you're gonna need it for you know their W-2s, maybe something like this, but when somebody leaves, just update their current address and email address as of the last date of employment. That way, if you do need to get in touch with them, you, you'll have at least the most recent information. But definitely, if, if you have non-competes, that's something you're gonna need to be aware of. Okay, this is an interesting one. And we talk about California being an at-will state. And generally, when we say that California is an at-will state, people laugh out loud because it's very difficult to uh, manage employee relations in California. And if people want to terminate somebody, you have to really look at a lot of things to make sure you're not violating anybody's rights. And we have a new thing to add to that analysis, and it's the presumption that if you have an employee who filed an action or complained about a potential violation of the labor code, either I didn't get a missed meal break penalty, I didn't get my overtime paid, I wasn't paid regular rate of pay, any something like that, and they either complained about it or filed a claim with the labor commissioner's office, if you as an employer terminate them within 90 days of that action, it is presumed that is because the employee employee complained about the labor code violation. Now that doesn't mean that you're just gonna lose out the gate. What it means is that you as the employer need to be prepared to prove that the reason for the termination was unrelated to the wage claim. So for example, you have an employee, they're tardy all the time, they keep missing work and they haven't called in, and so you have records that you talked to them about it. You provided your policy. They were late again. You wrote them up. They didn't show up one day. You gave them a warning. And you have documentation that you've done all these things. And then the employee is like, oh, I'm going to file a labor commission claim. And you're just like, we, we're done. You know, you missed work again. We can't have this here you're going to have documentation that the reason for the termination is completely unrelated to the wage claim. So it really is another reminder to us as employers to document all the reasons prior to termination. So if you're having somebody with performance issues, attendance issues, any of those things, document all of that very carefully so that you can rebut any presumption that it was retaliation for some protected activity. Okay, so we got a couple, we're gonna shift gears to agency and regulatory updates. Um, I'm guessing there's not a barn burner of questions where Mary would be 
appearing before our eyes. So I'll keep rolling. Oh, there she is. I will appear before your eyes to give you a moment. And magically, I am here. Um, yes, you know, I just wanted to uh, kind of, we always like to talk about the questions that we get on the hotline a lot. And I think and you did an amazing job explaining the PSL. And I think what's important for people to remember is PSL really isn't changing that much. It's not fundamentally changing. It's just expanding the amount of time that employees get off. And I think that's what's important for everyone to remember, because I think sometimes people think like, oh, this is a whole new law and it's all different. And it really isn't. So just remember, it's just a little more time. Definitely check your accrual versus your lump sum method. And we always say, do, or I always say, do what doesn't drive you crazy. So if it makes more sense to just do a lump sum and you don't have to worry about it, fantastic. If you want to do the accrual, great. If you want to have a different accrual method, yes, you can do that. But as Jessica was telling you, be very careful with it. Make sure that is compliant. That applies for full-time, part-time employees. It doesn't matter. So sometimes it may be a little more than you want to do. So take a look at that, but give us a call on the hotline if you have any more questions and we'll be happy to talk with you. Yep. All right. Back to you. Well, thank you. And the other thing, you know, sometimes employers like, well, can what if I want to do the accrual method for my hourly non-exempt employees, but I want to do the lump sum for my exempt employees? Great. I mean, do what works for your organization. And as Mary said, don't make it more complicated than it needs to be because your payroll people will not be happy. Um, but do what works for you. I mean, you got to just figure it out and make the business decision that works best for your organization. All right. So I mentioned we're going to talk about the Fair Chance Act. So I follow through on my promises. So the Fair Chance Act, we've been this has been around for a while. Uh, but the regulations did get updated last year. So that's why we're talking about it again. But just as a refresher, the main crux behind the Fair Chance Act is telling employers, if you have five or more employees, you can't look into criminal history in the interview process. Meaning, don't have anything on your application about it. Don't ask questions about it during the interview process. We just don't want to do that. It doesn't matter. However, we like this person. We're going to offer them a job, but we want to do a background check. So we do what's called a conditional offer of employment or a conditional job offer. And you say, we're going to offer, have to offer you this job so long as you successfully pass a background check. You can do that. So once you offer them the job, we're going to run the background check. Once you get the background check back, the only way you can deny that job or withdraw that offer is if you can establish that whatever comes up in their criminal background has a direct and adverse relationship to the duties the employee is expected to perform. So what does that mean? Have really, really good job descriptions. Very clear what the person's gonna be doing, what the essential functions of that job are, because what's gonna happen is you see something in the background, you've gotta be able to say, because of this, they will not be able to safely or effectively perform the job duties that are required of this position. Therefore, we're going to deny employment. If you do make that determination, and it's a very individualized assessment, you have to give employees notice. Hey, here's what happened. Here's what's in the background. This is how it's related to the job. We're going to withdraw the offer. The employee can then say, no, that wasn't me or here's some documentation, or look, these are all the things I've done since then, you know, in order to mitigate all of those things. And so it's kind of a bit of an interactive process. The regulations of last year have expanded that process and those protections from just an applicant for employment to employees who are provide, uh, applying for internal positions like, oh, there's a new position over in the such and such department. I've been at the company for five years. I want that job. I'm going to apply. I get those same protections with my criminal background. Even employees saying, hey, I would really love, in that, love to work in that department if anything ever opens up. Those same protections are going to apply to me. It also applies if, let's say you're going to do a layoff or if you're going to move people to a different location or you're selling the business. So you got to be real careful if you do background checks. 
is the summary on that. So for example, you have a manager having a casual conversation with employee Betty and Betty disclosed she has a drug conviction. The manager does not wanna consider Betty for the promotion now. Is this okay? What do we think? We know the answer and absolutely not. The manager really has to consider Betty without regard to that criminal history because employees uh, for promotion are protected. Even if it's a voluntary disclosure, you didn't even do a background check, but Betty told you. So you're gonna have to go through that Fair Chance Act process. Okay, she has a drug conviction. How is this related to the job she's gonna perform? And you have to look at the job she's gonna perform. And you also have to take into consideration, again, those mitigating factors. For example, Betty's worked for you for a while. She's been an effective employee. Let's, I assume she's gotten good uh, performance evaluations. So you're gonna really have to demonstrate and work hard to say that she's not gonna be able to perform this job. But again, it really turns on that job description. So for example, easiest example, you're hiring somebody to be a driver for your company and they have a DUI conviction. You know, that's a pretty direct connection. However, if the DUI conviction is from five years ago, the person has been through rehab, they've been in treatment, they continue to get therapy, they continue to do group, you have to look at all of those things. And then you have to make a smart decision for your organization. So it's not an easy process, but you do have to be very deliberate about it because you don't want to violate somebody's rights under FEHA. So I was talking about individualized assessment, sort of like that interactive process with yourself to determine if somebody can say, safely and effectively perform the job. We do have a fact sheet for our members, but one thing that the employee or applicant can do is give them information, give you information. I challenge this conviction. You know, I'm still waiting for it to be overturned because we provided new evidence. I've been to, through rehab. I, you know, I've been volunteering and I've done this, 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 and this because, and I've learned and those sort of things. You can't require the applicant or employee to do it, but sometimes employees opt to do it because they want the job. A lot of times when an employer denies employment based on this, that applicant disappears, but sometimes the, the applicant really does want that job and they've worked really hard to overcome what got them into that uh, situation to begin with. But employment history records, training, rehab, you know, letters of reference from, you know, people in the community, documentation of traumas, police reports, disability. So a lot of interactive process to determine with the applicant whether this is actually going to work. So use caution and be really deliberate in that process. All right, switching again. Now we're talking about the National Labor Relations Act. So the National Labor Relations Act is a federal law and all laws are enforced by a state or federal agency. And the National Labor Relations Act is enforced by the National Labor Relations Board, the NLRB. So if you hear people talking about the NLRB, that's what that is. And these protections apply to all employees. Doesn't matter whether you have a union or not all employees are protected by the National Labor Relations Act, as well as by opinions issued by the NLRB and opinion letters uh, issued by the chief counsel of the NLRB. The current makeup of the board and the current general counsel of the NLRB have stated very clearly that they are employee friendly and pro-union. So a lot of the opinions that they're issuing air to the benefit of employees to a great extent. So again, the NLRB applies to all employers. It doesn't matter whether a union has ever been in your house or not. One of the things that comes up is what's called Section 7 rights. So Section 7 of the NLRA talks about employees' rights to discuss wages, hours, and terms and conditions of employment without interference or retribution, retaliation by their employer. So section seven rights are very, very broad and the current makeup of the board and general counsel of the NLRB have stated that anything that infringes or even implies that an employee cannot talk about these things is going to be a violation of the act. 
very, very broad. Now, again, California, we have labor code protections. And in California, we can't prohibit employees from talking about wages anyway. But this is a grander scale under the NLRB. So if people have heard about the Stary cycle decision, um, that's what we're talking about. But really what's more important is what these cases and the trend of cases in particular Sarah Cycle have said is that if an employee challenges an employer's policy on, or workplace rule stating that the employer inhibited their ability to talk about terms and conditions of employment to complain about workplace conditions, it's gonna be presumed that the employer's policy is unlawful because the standard that the board is looking at is whether the policy has a reasonable tendency to chill employees' exercise of their rights. So chill, that's it. So the employer would have to turn around and prove that they have a legitimate substantial business interest in the rule, and there's no way that that rule can be promoted with a more narrowly tailored written policy. So you can feel the weight of those words, that it is a grand challenge for an employer to defend a policy that chills an employee's exercise of their rights, and the board is more likely than not to side with the employees. So we have an article, we've got a recorded webinar, we have a lot of information on this, but the main thing to think about is in your employee handbook, make sure it's clear that your policies have in no way intend to inhibit or chill an employee's exercise of their rights. So if you have questions about that, or you can go to our website under employee handbooks, our, our handbook, or pardon me, our website is employers.org and under services, we have employee handbooks and we have our 2024 updates document on that page on our website. If you'd like to take a look at that, that gives you some sort of insight on how we've addressed that particular issue. But it is really, really important to look through all of your policies to make sure that you're not running afoul of this new standard. Okay, so here's an example. If you have a policy that says, it is un dis you cannot discuss work matters or you can only discuss work matters with other employees who have a specific business reason to know or have access to such information. That will not work anymore. Likely, we could say, do not disclose confidential financial data or other non-public proprietary company information. Do not share confidential information regarding business partners, vendors, or customers. Likely that would withhold this standard. But again, make sure you have disclaimers and other language in your policy, making it clear that you're not trying to infringe on people's rights under the act. So for this section, we talked about a lot of things. We talked about cannabis rights. We talked about the Fair Chance Act. We talked about the NLRB. So take a look at your job applications. Make sure they're up to date for 2024. We had to revise our job application for 2024. Make sure your interview questions are compliant with all these new rules, cannabis rights, criminal history, all of those sort of things. So make sure your managers uh, and interviewing people who are interviewing folks are aware of all these requirements. If you prepare standard interview questions for all interviews, make sure you look at those before doing interviews in 2024. And audit and update your employee handbooks and policies with this new NLRB standard as well. You probably don't need to do anything around um, interview process and things like that, because that's not gonna be in your handbook, but any policies that could implicate that NLRB standard, you do wanna take a look at that and make sure you have the appropriate language in there. All right, you got anything else for me, Mary, before I take over the Q&A box? I think we are all caught up. Thank you for sharing all of that information, which is informative, yet somewhat terrifying for everyone. We know, we know it gets tricky for sure. All right. I Perfect. All right. Jessica will be in the Q&A. Everyone encourage, throw some questions her way, make her think through these difficult to HR issues that everyone has to deal with on a daily basis. And she's filled you in a lot on paid sick leave 
and all of the things that we need to be thinking about employee protections, I'm going to spend a little time talking about kind of some of those day-to-day -day things that we really have to be thinking about, which I know you've probably been thinking a lot about wage an hour over the past couple of weeks because it's a brand new year, although it feels like it's been 2024 for about seven months already, but we're at the start of a year, which means we're thinking about making sure everybody's wages are correct, making sure we've got people classified correctly. And one of the number one things we still see employers make a mistake on just some general wage and hour basics. So let's kind of start where we need to be looking here for how we're gonna pay our employees. Keep in mind, our minimum wage in California is constantly evolving and often changing. And if you remember in years past, it used to be based on your employer size. So if you were considered a large employer and had 26 or more employees, you were paying a certain rate. If you were a smaller employer, you were paying a different rate. So we are all done with that now. And every employer in California is required to pay a minimum of $16 per hour for your employees. So everyone needs to be making at least $16 an hour. The reason why we also want to pay attention to what our state hourly wage is, is because that affects our state salary requirement for our exempt employees or our salaried employees. So what you do is you take that minimum wage, you multiply it by two, and you multiply it by 2080, and that gives you this number of 66,560. So keep in mind, your hourly or your non-exempt employees always have to be making $16 an hour. Your exempt or your salaried employees always have to be making a minimum of 66560 Now, you might be looking at that exempt salary and thinking, uh-oh, I didn't know that changed. What am I going to do? I'm only paying my exempt employees $60,000 or maybe $62,000, and I just can't bump them up right now to meet that minimum salary threshold. Well, we have some tips and suggestions for you. So you can access those on our website. And we gave some information because so many businesses are doing this now. A lot of employers are switching their exempt or their salaried employees back to non-exempt or hourly. And you might be thinking, can we do that? Absolutely. Because remember in California, every employee actually defaults to being a non-exempt or an hourly employee. And it's up to you as the business to show that someone should not just be paid hourly. So when it comes to an exempt employee, there's the salary requirement, but there's also a duties test. So keep that in mind. But let's talk first about transitioning your employees if you do need to change them from exempt to non-exempt. Remember, when they become a non-exempt employee, they're gonna fall under all of the requirements of a non-exempt employee which means they need to get their rest breaks. They also need to have meal periods. They need to be paid overtime if they're working more than eight hours in a day. So we need to make sure that we are kind of retraining or recoaching them on how to be a non-exempt hourly employee. Because for some of them, maybe they haven't been an hourly employee for quite some time. So we need to make sure they're following our time, clocking in, clocking out procedures, and they are doing everything that every non-exempt employee can do. Sometimes employers make the mistake of saying, well, I'm gonna call them an, an, a non-exempt salaried employee. Doesn't really exist in California. So if you're a non-exempt employee, you have to have that minimum hourly wage that they're being paid, and you need to make sure they're being paid for overtime, meal and rest breaks, all of those good things that you know you need to do for your non-exempt hourly employees. Now, talking about exempt employees for a minute here. So I'm showing you the new requirement for an annual wage of 66,560. Remember, that's just one component of making someone an exempt employee. They also need to pass what's known as the duties test. So they need to either be classified as a professional or an administrative exemption, or perhaps a, um, managerial. So there's different categories they can fall into. I'm also going to show you a couple of other categories in the health field and IT. But remember, it's not just as easy as saying, I want someone to be salaried, then I won't have to worry about breaks and meal periods. I wish you didn't have to worry about that too. But you do want to make sure you are classifying your employees correctly. And don't make the mistake of just classifying someone as exempt just because they are at that salary level or perhaps just because the person asks to and they say, that's okay, I'll just, I just want to be exempt. You don't have to pay me overtime. 
You can't do that in California. You've got to make sure you're following along with all of those requirements. Now, Jessica told you all about paid sick leave and how that has expanded. Well, we have some changes when it comes to minimum wage as well. So we have, besides just our state minimum wage, we have 40 different local ordinances. So some cities and some counties that are doing their own minimum wages. Now, the good thing to keep in mind, thinking of our exempt employees for just a moment, we've got a link here for minimum wages by location. There's a bit.ly on this slide and you can see what every other city is doing in California. But even if a particular city or county or jurisdiction is paying a higher minimum wage, that does not affect the salary requirement in most circumstances. I'll show you one area where it does. But keep in mind, we just have to focus on that state salary minimum requirement when we're looking at our employees, even if they are working in a city that has a higher different hourly minimum wage. So that's kind of nice. So keep in mind your exempt employees, as long as they're at that 66,560, in most circumstances, that is fine, regardless of the location that they are working at. All right, so let's focus again here on minimum wage for just a minute. What you need to keep in mind here is that it, a wage for an employee is based on where they are performing work. So you are in near the Bay Area, lots of cities in the Bay Area have higher minimum wages. So if you have an employee that's going into Emeryville, or maybe they're hitting, um, heading into the city, they're going to be in San Francisco, there are higher minimum wages. So you need to make sure if you have an hourly employee, they're heading into those cities and they're performing work there, that they are being paid that appropriate wage. So take a look at that bit.ly if you do have employees that are kind of traveling around, or if you have employees that are working remotely from their home, you need to make sure that they are being paid that appropriate wage forever that work is being performed. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about some industry specific wages here in just a second. So another thing to keep in mind when we're talking about paying our employees correctly, personal vehicle usage. So if you have your employees run some errands for you. So for example, if you say, hey Mary, can you go run to the bank uh, make a deposit for the company on the way back. Can you swing by Starbucks? We've got a drink order in and then come back to the office and we need you to take your own car. So then I am being directed by my company to go drive on the company's behalf, which means I'm using my personal vehicle, which means I need to be reimbursed for that. So when an employee is using their personal vehicle, you need to not only pay them for their time, you need to pay them a mileage reimbursement. Now, every year the IRS sets a mileage reimbursement rate. For 2024, it is 67 cents per mile. Now you as an employer are not required by law to pay this rate, but we strongly encourage you to pay that rate because what the IRS says is if you are paying your employees 67 cents a mile, that covers gas, that covers insurance and wear and tear on the vehicle. If you wanna pay less than that 67 cents a mile, and the employee incurs some sort of expense, maybe they get a flat tire, something along those lines, you could be responsible for paying a portion of that. So that's why we advise go ahead and pay that IRS rate of 67 cents a mile, and that's for any time that they are driving on the company's behalf for you. So if you say, I want you to go pick up something at Starbucks, or if you say to them, I want you to attend this out of um, area conference, and you're going to drive to it, it's a three hour drive, your normal commute is 30 minutes or 30 miles, you're gonna be driving two and a half extra hours, I'm gonna pay you for that time, and I'm also going to pay and reimburse for those extra miles. So keep that in mind. A lot of businesses, especially we work with a couple of pizza chains, they will pay just a flat reimbursement rate. It is often not equivalent to that 67 cents a mile, so there's a little bit of uh, potential risk there. So we advise keep it safe, pay that IRS rate, have your employees track their mileage, and then you reimburse them for that time. And of course, as a non-exempt employee, we're always paying for that time. Anytime they're under our control and we are directing them to do something for us, they are on the clock. So talking about another salary issue, as I mentioned, there's a couple of different areas. We talked about a professional exempt exemption, administrative exemption, as well as that managerial exemption. 
Well, we have a couple of other ones for physicians and computer software professionals. So there is no greater time for you to encourage young children, and I will encourage all of my teenagers, let's look into that physician field because the increase has gone up to $101.22 per hour. That is how much a physician or surgeon needs to be paid in order to be classified as exempt. And computer professional softwares, they are at $55.58 an hour, which is an annual equivalent to 115,763 and change. Now keep in mind for computer software professionals, we often see individuals misclassified. This should be a very high level position. This could be your director of IT, maybe it's your webmaster. This is a high level computer software professional. So take a look at these salaries and, and the other information that we've given you just to make sure it's beginning of the year is a great time to do a check to make sure that you've got your individuals classified correctly as exempt. Um, take a look at those professional exemptions. And then of course, always take a look at that salary, make sure they are meeting those salary requirements because there's just a lot of liability if you don't pay your employees correctly here in California. Speaking, we'll just continue on the trend of money, remote work expense reimbursements. So if you are requiring your employees to work remotely, so for example, you've downsized and you have a much smaller office and there's not office space for employees, or you're encouraging your employees to, and you're saying, well, you could come in, but why don't you work from home three days a week and then come into the office two days a week? you need to make sure that you are reimbursing your employees some of those work from home costs. Now, we have not had very clear direction on this from the state. It's unfortunate they haven't kind of set up some parameters for this. So what we advise is you wanna make sure you are reimbursing your employees a reasonable percentage or a reasonable cost for these things that they might be incurring. So for example, if they're required to use the internet from home for work, you need to reimburse some of those internet costs. If they are needing equipment, of course, we need to make sure we're providing our employees with the proper equipment. So do they need a laptop? Do they need a printer? Do they need ink for that printer? Any of those other office supplies, paper that an individual might need. And then what about phones? Are we requiring them to use their mobile phone? So if you say um, our time card system is a mobile app only, you need to use your personal phone for that, download this app, and that's how you clock in and out. Well, then we're requiring our employees to use a personal device, and so we need to reimburse them something for that. So really what you want to do is take a look at what is a reasonable amount based on how much time that employee is utilizing some of those work from home issues. So are they um, using their phone exclusively? Are they on their personal mobile phone all day for work? well, then you're probably going to reimburse a little more. And if you're looking at most cell phone plans are 50 to $60 or so, and they're using that phone a great portion of the day, probably reimbursing them at least half of that mobile phone bill probably makes sense. Same thing for internet. Are they utilizing the internet all day as they work for you? Probably need to reimburse a little higher percentage versus somebody who just works from home one day a week. Maybe you can have two different tiers of reimbursements. So take a look at that. Great best practice is to have an agreement with your employees so they understand really what the parameters are from working from home as far as performance and expectations, as well as those reimbursement costs. And then you also want to say to the employee, we believe this is a reasonable reimbursement amount. Um, if you believe your costs are higher than that, please contact us and let us know what, those, what you believe those costs should be. But then it's really up to the employee to prove to you or show to you that they need to get a little extra money based on how they're utilizing some of those personal devices. All right, so here are your to-dos for our first section here. Definitely keep an eye on those county and city minimum wages. Keep in mind, January 1st is a big time of year where there are city changes, especially state changes, but there are also cities that increase their minimum wage in April. And also, especially, there are a lot that do it July 1st. So keep an eye on that because you might think, oh, I checked in January and it's fine. But if there are mid-year changes, you want to make sure you're staying on top of that as well. Um, there, as Jessica mentioned, all sorts of poster updates. So make sure you've got a 2024 up-to-date poster and make sure you've got the appropriate poster for your work location where your employees are working. 
again, put together some remote work agreement agreements. So everybody's on the same page about when they're supposed to be in the office, when they work from home, what those expectations are. And of course, we always want to reimburse our employees for any of those business related expenses. So travel above and beyond their regular commute. If they need to go by paper because they're printing up 50 packets for an on-site meeting that they're doing, all of those costs need to be reimbursed to those individuals. And of course, you know, keep an eye, as I mentioned, on those minimum wages because you might need to budget for a mid-year increase. So just stay up to date on that. Make sure, of course, you're getting our newsletter and you're checking our website because we always do update that minimum wage that we were telling you about. And Jessica's back. Got some questions, Jessica? Hello. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, as you were saying that about expense reimbursement, uh, we got a question and I, it's always a good one to clarify. Expense reimbursement is different from compensation. So for example, like Mary's example, if Mary went to the bank, Mary's an exempt employee. Mary gets paid the same whether she's working 20 hours a week or 80 hours a week but she drives to the bank on behalf of California Employers Association, she gets reimbursed for her mileage. If Mary was an hourly non-exempt employee and she went to the bank after work one day, like on her way home, she gets reimbursed for her mileage, but she also gets compensated for the time that it took to go to the bank. So I wanted to clarify those two things because that was a good question that we got. And that's all I got. Thank you so much. All right, let's start talking a little bit about safety updates. And I will just quickly say, based on the picture on the slide, since I was in a manufacturing environment, we don't wear our three inch heels out on the floor, everybody. So that was your first safety test. You don't wear high heels on a slick manufacturing floor. All right, so let's talk about the big one. Um, we've been getting a lot of questions on this. And I will say this one is, the good news is first of all, take a breath because we don't have to worry about this until July but we are still waiting to get some more information on this. So there's a new requirement for businesses to establish, implement, and maintain yet another plan. This one is your workplace violence prevention plan, but we do have until July 1st of this year to put this into place. Now, there are a couple of industries that are um, exempted from this, um, employees that are teleworking. If you're a small business with less than 10 employees, that's not really accessible to the public. We're waiting for some more clarification on what that means as far as accessible to the public. But as long as you have an IIPP and you're a smaller business, you probably don't have to do this. Um, healthcare facilities, law enforcement, Department of Corrections, they already have their own guidelines in place for workplace violence prevention. And keep in mind, if you go Google this after our uh, call today and you put in workplace violence prevention plan, you will get a lot of information and some potential sample plans, but those are gonna be for different industries, very specialized industries. So you don't wanna use those yet. So stay tuned for this. We will be getting some more information about it. But what this is going to mean is that you're going to put together a plan and your employees are most likely going to have an opportunity. It might be all of your employees. It might be a group of employees who are going to be able to kind of comment and give some suggestions for what should be in this workplace violence prevention plan. But you're gonna put this together and I'll show you a slide, um, a little more detail on it. But the real thing to keep in mind is this is something you're going to add to your training program. So when your employees start with you, we always encourage you to do harassment prevention training on day one or within that first week. You are also going to now be providing workplace violence prevention plan training. And that's something that's going to happen every year. Remember, harassment prevention is every other year. This is going to be an annual training. Now, when we start to put together this document, our workplace violence plan, you can incorporate it into your IIPP or use it as a or do it as a standalone document. We would advise a standalone document just makes it easier, I feel, to manage these things. If you're just looking at individual documents, sometimes when you lump all those documents in together and there's an update that's needed with one document but not another, just makes it a little tricky. So I think it's a little easier just to keep this as a standalone document. You are going to have some requirements. As I mentioned, you're gonna be getting some feedback from your employees. You, once you put this plan together, you are going to be doing an inspection of the workplace to make sure that you are addressing any of those safety issues. 
if there's ever an incident or a new hazard, you're going to make sure, of course, you're going to do an investigation or an inspection to see what happened. You are going to be keeping what's known as a violent incident log. So you are going to be recording um, when something happens in the workplace. Now, I'm hoping that that's going to be a very small log with very few entries for you, but it is something you're going to need to start doing as part of your record retention. You're going to make sure that you're holding on to that violent incident log for five years, and you're going to maintain those training records when you train your employees for at least a year. So you're going to be holding on to a little more documentation with this. Now, why this has been a little tricky and why we don't have a lot of clarification on what this plan is going to be, because this is something that was actually implemented by the state legislature and not by Cal OSHA. And so Cal OSHA actually has until 2025 to propose standards for this plan. And so that's why we've got a little bit of a disconnect between what the state government was doing versus the state agency. So that's why I would say stay tuned. We'll get some more info for you. We do work with several safety partners and we'll be putting out some more information to give you some guidance on what you need to do um, as you start to put together this plan. But you might be thinking, you know, what are some examples of things that I might have to record? And this could be a wide variety. This could be an attack maybe between two employees if there is a fight um, with or without a weapon, something breaks out in the workplace, something happens in the workplace. Maybe there is a threat of using a weapon against somebody. Um, I think what might happen for um, some businesses um, that really is this animal attack. If you are working outside, if you are a landscape company, for example, um, and you've got your employees working at a location and someone is bitten by a dog, that's going to be an example of recording this on this new incident log. Um, also, it could be if there is some sort of sexual assault or some sort of um, physical sexual conduct, this kind of is going to fall again under that potential harassment. We might have a little bit of crossover between those two things. So um, stay tuned. We'll definitely be giving you some more information on this as we um, have it available and as we get some guidance. But do plan on just put a little note that in May and June, you're gonna to wanna to check back in and see what the new guidelines are for putting together this plan so it's in place for you on July 1st. You wanna figure out if you don't have a designated safety person who is going to be responsible for this, you're gonna make sure you put it on your to-do to train your employees when you've got that plan put together. And then again, hold on to those records and follow your record retention policy and requirements so you can make sure you've got those documents in case they are ever called upon. So a couple of things on COVID. It's just one little slide. I promise it's not too bad. Um, keep in mind as COVID changes and regulations change, there have been some good changes for employers. Um, so one of the things you are no longer required to do in the past, you were supposed to notify your workers comp carrier um, when you had an employee who tested positive and that was inside or outside of work. They just contracted COVID. You were supposed to notify your workers comp carrier you no longer need to do that. And that was as of January 1st of this year. So take that off of your to-do. Hopefully your worker comp carrier notified you of that as well. You are still required to have a COVID prevention plan. We have these permanent COVID standards that are in effect until next year um, with some record keeping requirements through 2026. So again, keep holding on to these documents. There are guidelines or there should be guidelines in your COVID prevention plan regarding when employees need to stay outside of the workforce when they test positive. Um, of course, when there are outbreaks, um, there's different guidelines. If you are CEA members, do make sure that you are taking a look at all of our COVID resources, especially our toolkit, which is a wonderful checklist you can use as we're dealing with these things. And as you probably heard on the 9th, uh, the state came out with some new guidelines about when employees do or do not need to be excluded. They have loosened them up substantially. So make sure you're staying up to date on those. Those are under the CDPH, the California Department of Public Health. Um, so you are able to have your employees come back to work much earlier. The five-day guideline does not exist anymore. Um, but there are some guidelines still in place that you do need to notify employees when they are considered a close contact, just so that they know um, that there was somebody in the workplace that had COVID, and there's some recommendations regarding mask wearing, et cetera. So make sure you're still following along with those. I know we all want to get rid of it, but we're getting close. It's much better, but do make sure you're following along with those guidelines for part of your safety plan at work.
All right, let's talk about just a couple of industry specific updates. Um, for those of you that know people that work in fast food, um, I have a couple of teenagers, a lot of their friends, one of mine works there and a lot of their friends work in fast food. They're just thrilled about this new $20 an hour minimum wage requirement that goes into effect officially April 1st of 2024. What I can tell you, uh, I'm outside of Sacramento, our local McDonald's and In-N-Out have already bumped their employees to $20 an hour. So they did not wait for April 1st. They just went ahead and did it. But this is that, um, you've probably been hearing about this off and on for a couple of years, that FAST Act, it was then repealed, it was going to be put on the ballot, and then now we've just finally come up with this new guideline that is in effect now for April 1st. And this created this fast food council. It falls under the DIR, that's the Department of Industrial Relations, and they put together recommendations on working conditions, minimum wage, et cetera, and they are going to be in place until 2029. So we will see what else um, they throw at us. But what they are saying is if you are a chain that has over 60 establishments nationally, then you are going to be providing your employees with a much higher minimum wage if you meet some of these requirements. So if you're providing food and beverages for immediate consumption, so kind of that drive-through takeout idea, um, people pay before they consume the food, limited or no table service, um, those are kind of the guidelines. So if you think of those fast food restaurants, there are a couple of exceptions in place for bakeries and grocery stores. Also, we're still waiting for some clarity um, about certain locations, you know, Starbucks inside of a Target, for example. If you're kind of falling under this and you're thinking, I don't really know if this applies to me or not or what I need to follow, definitely recommend consult with legal counsel on this if you think you could be part of this group just to make sure that you are complying with that because this is a big change that businesses are going to have to deal with. Now, here's one of the changes um, when I was mentioning before about that salary exempt minimum salary requirement. We're still waiting for clear guidance on this, but it does appear that this particular provision will affect that salary exempt requirement. So it looks like people in the fast food industry that fall under this AB 1228 guidelines will need to be making a higher salary exempt wage. So they would be at 83,200. So again, it takes that $20, multiplies it by two and that 2080, which gives us a much higher wage than the state standard, which is closer to that 66,560. So, um, Stay tuned for this one. We're still waiting to get some more information on this. We're wondering if this will affect other businesses in increasing their minimum wages. I have a child that works at a non-chain restaurant and they said, oh, no way, we are not increasing our minimum wage. So they are still at the state minimum wage. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out over the next year or so. So stay tuned for that. Now, if you are in the food industry, I'm sure you're very familiar with food handler cards. In the past, it was a little unclear if the business needed to pay for an employee to get a food handler card if they didn't have one or could you require it? Well, they have clarified that for us now. And they say that now employers are responsible for all costs if the employee does not have a valid or a current card. That means you're paying for their time to take that training. You're paying for any cost for them to get that card. So that is something that now is your responsibility. So that's compensable time. They're on the clock when they're watching that video and taking that training and they're on the clock when they're taking that test and any cost associated you are now responsible for. So again, probably something to make as part of your new hire orientation process. They do have to have that within 30 days of hire. I would recommend you just add it to their first couple of days of work when you're doing all of their training. Go ahead and get that food handler card for them as quickly as possible. So do make sure you update any of your policies, your onboarding practices, et cetera. So this is an interesting change that we had, and then it just recently got rechanged. So there were some new healthcare minimum wage requirements that were supposed to go into effect June 1st. This is now on hold. Um, the governor said, well, let's hold on for a moment. Maybe we're not going to institute this quite yet. So if you are in the healthcare field, um, keep an eye on this. Of course, I imagine you are already working with counsel. It is quite confusing over the different guidelines for being um, an exempt employee and how much they have to be paid. There are some fancy calculations that are required. So 
work with council, keep an eye on this. Um, we'll get some more information as it becomes available. But if you're in the healthcare field, as you know, you fall under some different guidelines anyway. So you wanna make sure that, um, you know, keep an eye on this and see if it does indeed officially get pushed back and what you're gonna to need to do um, once it gets implemented later this year or next year. All right, a couple of other things to keep in mind. Sorry, one more little thing on COVID. Um, right to recall, if you are a hotel, an event center, um, airport hospitality service providers, a couple of other industries, you are familiar with the right to recall rules. Those are um, still in effect until the end of 2025. So make sure you are following those guidelines. Also, if you fall into um, an indoor um, environment, perhaps it's a warehouse where you have a door open all the time. Um, they are talking about some indoor heat illness standards. This is something they've talked about for years off and on. We've been watching this and it looks like they might try to vote on that in the first quarter of this year. Probably won't implement anything until the summer of 2024, but if you fall into those areas, um, keep an eye out for that. Normally that, if you're familiar with the outdoor heat illness standard, there's already an outdoor one that's been in place for years, but they're normally looking at something when temperatures exceed 82 degrees, um, you need to provide water or additional rest breaks, those kind of things. So keep an eye on this if you're um, in an industry or if you have a facility um, that might be affected and, and we'll give you some more information as soon as we know about it. All right. Oh, I thought I would excite everyone and forget to put in the HRCI codes. I am so sorry. I did not update those. So I am going to ask Anna or Jessica if they could please drop those into the chat box. I apologize for that, everybody. I was having some internet glitches earlier, and I don't think that got saved. But real quick, let me show you another slide. Um, I want to remind everybody, if you find that you need a little extra assistance, and something above and beyond the hotline. Anna did put the hotline number into the chat box, so make sure you grab that. It's also on your slide. But again, you can call us Monday through Friday, eight to five. Anytime you have questions or concerns, we are happy to help you. But sometimes you might need a little more help. Maybe you need us to put together an employee handbook for all the things, uh, the policy updates that Jessica and I told you about today. Um, maybe you need us to come on site and help you with some training or help you with projects. So you might need a membership and we're happy to help you with that. Um, so do make sure you um, visit our website. If you need some more info, we will set you up and get you on track with that. And I wanted to, I'm just gonna jump forward real quick because I wanted everyone to be able to capture this slide too. As Anna said, it's a great idea to do a screenshot. Um, so you've got that hotline number, but you do have that employee handbook training coming up on the 14th. And some of you might know Eli Nunez. He's come down to Monterey before to do some training. He's a great trainer. He's doing that handbook training. And I know he will give you lots of really good info. So be sure to join him for that. All right. And I am going to bring back our survey slide. And I'll turn it. Anything else we need to cover, Jessica? Or I'll give it back to Anna. All right. Back to Anna it goes. Thanks so much, everybody. All right. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Mary, for the uh, comprehensive training on all the updates we should be aware of. Um, and uh, if you didn't catch it in the chat, um, or if you're just listening and not able to pay attention to the chat, your HRCI code 650869, SHRM code 24-M as in Mary, Q, 6D as in David, V. Um, CEA info at employers.org. If you run into any trouble with those codes or you just missed it, i more than happy to help you get credit for today. Um, two more things. I did drop the link to the next training coming up in February. Uh, spend your Valentine's Day morning with us, uh, learning about updating your employee handbook with all these laws that you, uh, that you just learned about. Um, and then I did drop the link to the survey. You can also access it by the QR code on your screen right now. Um, that really does provide us with the feedback that we use to improve on trainings like these and make sure that you have all the tools you need to run your companies and your departments with more peace of mind. So with that, I want to say thank you again to Laura and the entire team at Monterey County um, for gathering all of you here today live. Thank you for showing up live and we look forward to seeing you all in February. Cheers. Thank you.